welcome to another Descent into Research Madness. This time I wanted to know why we ended up with pink for girls and blue for boys, and is there more to the story? Well, it turns out that the research is rather spotty on this subject. I had been taught that it really started up after World War II when we were trying to commercialize everything and making people purchase more than one set of baby clothes during the baby boom made tons of commercial sense. However, I was also taught that prior to that point, the colors were sort of reversed and it was pink for boys and blue for girls and that there's a big argument over the whole thing. But when I went and looked at the more recent research, a lot of that had been vaguely debunked. And I say that simply because a lot of it came down to only a couple of references and those references were just thrown away as, oh, well, there's just a misunderstanding. We didn't switch back and forth. It's always been pink for girls and blue for boys. And you know, the rest of it's just people not really doing their research properly, which of course I take as a complete challenge. So I have dug so deep that I'm pretty sure that I found dinosaur bones in this rabbit hole. So let's get into how we ended up with not just pink for girls and blue for boys, but the entire idea of gendered color, why we chose pink and blue, and more importantly, how we've ended up with pink being such a girly color that quite a few consider it inappropriate for boys or men entirely. We're going to start with looking at blue and pink as actual colors. The term blue goes back incredibly far and is prevalent in numerous languages all over Europe, so it's a very old term. However, the term pink is very recent. It really doesn't pick up meaning a color until the 18th century. Prior to that point, pink referred to jagged edges. So if you've ever used a pair of pinking shears in crafts or sewing, you'll know that that zigzag edge is referred to pinking. And that is what brought us to the color. You see the dianthus flower has those jagged edges and we started colloquially referring to them as pinks. And therefore, because they are pink in color, we started associating the term with the color as well. The added irony to this is that before we used the term pink, it was much more common to use the term rose for the same range of colors, which is yet another flower-based color. So there's definitely a theme that I'm sensing here. Throughout the research that I'm going to show you, you'll see both pink and rose used simply because rose was much more common before pink was. Now, the first reference that I could manage to easily find my way back to was from 1856. I also found it mentioned in this book, Pink and Blue by Joe Paoletti, who specifically talks about the broader aspects of pink and blue and did a ton of research into not just written documents, but also looked at birth announcements and cards and baby paraphernalia, such so tons of stuff. And she also made it back to 1856. And it is an article in Godey's Ladies Magazine that is talking about the impending birth of the child of Napoleon III and Eugenie over in France. And this royal child is being prepared for in large scale. And this specific article talks about the fact that there is a massive layout. All the baby stuff is being prepared in light blue. But the article specifies that it is not because they are hoping for a boy, in the case of blue for boys and pink for girls, which they say is common in France. However, they are doing it because they are associating this baby with the Virgin Mary and they want to place it under her protection, regardless of gender. And light blue is a color that is associated with the Virgin Mary. So they are doing it specifically for concerns over the child's health, not because of gender. Interestingly enough, I found a few other articles about the same exact event when I looked into UK magazines, and they have differing stories. One says that the blue was specifically chosen because they are hoping for a boy, and the third says that they prepared a full blue layout as well as a rose layout for the baby, and they'll be prepared for whichever gender. The actual accuracy of the story is not important for this part. What is important is that blue and rose are listed as gendered colors coming out of France. And since I was struggling to find find anything in American newspapers that took me further back with blue and pink, I decided to track it down through some French roots. And what I came up with was an article that was just a year later. It's from the perspective of a French traveler in Europe, and they are in Holland, the Netherlands, and specifically talking about the Dutch practice of decorating their doors after the birth of a child in blue or rose, depending on the gender. And apparently, supposedly, this is a practice that was brought over with the Spanish. It's really the only way they explain it. Not a lot of information to go off of, but it's interesting in the fact that the French, as of 1857, are presenting this as something that is abnormal and something that they clearly don't see as a universal practice, but something specific to the Dutch. So even if pink for girls and blue for boys is somehow 
more deeply rooted in French history, it's still somewhat of a literally foreign concept to them to treat it in that way. But this gave me a thread to pull on, so I started looking for any other references in English or French about the Dutch practice. I unfortunately don't have access to Dutch databases or really know the language very well. Interrupting that video with an update and research, because due to the help of a very lovely Dutch person in my Twitch livestream, and the realization that Google Books actually has some Dutch works in the database meant that I was able to continue this research a little bit further. So what I had found was quite a few references from English and French travelers into the Netherlands talking about their various experiences with this practice. Some said that there was a small board put outside with the information about the birth. Others said that there was a lace cap or a pin cushion or a door knocker. They all had slightly different ways of talking about whatever this practice was, and they all mentioned different colors representing different genders. White, red, pink, and blue all got mentioned in there in various ways, and it was pretty unclear what the actual practice was. But in the 1808 version that I found, they do mention a very specific word, which that allowed me to then put that word in because it actually means what I need it to mean and follow it back in dictionaries and other writings from the 18th and 19th centuries in Dutch. So this term took me to not only those references, but also to actual surviving pieces in museums. So this is what they are talking about. It is a little square of lace with trimmed edges, and the background of it is red, or to some eyes might be a little bit more pink, depends on how faded it is. And this would go out onto the door after the birth of a child to announce the birth of a child and to tell people to leave them alone. Essentially, it worked sort of like an old version of maternity and paternity leave, where this would go up, all of the neighbors, the friends, the family, everyone would know that they had just had a baby, and they would essentially leave the entire family alone during that time. Not just in the sense of don't bother them with menial things, but in the sense of you can't collect debts, you can't arrest them, you can't bother them. And yes, they did occasionally get kind of overused, and so there were some regulations on how long it could go for at the very least, but this was a practice done in a few specific cities and areas in the Netherlands during the 19th, 18th, and potentially all the way back to the 17th or even 16th centuries. And this essentially was just a way of saying, we had a baby, leave us alone. The part where it comes into the colors and gender is the fact that if they put it up as is, it denoted that they had a boy. If they slid in white, sort of making it party color, half red, half white in the background, that meant that they had a girl. So there was inevitably going to be some confusion by travelers who weren't necessarily understanding what that specifically meant in terms of what color represented what, or whether it was red or pink or all those different things. So I can see how the mix-up occurred and how this piece of Lace was also misunderstood as both a little board of information, a lace cap, a thing that essentially replaced where the door knocker was or a little cushion for the door knocker. I can see how things got a little mixed up with what this means. Interestingly enough, this general practice is still being done in the Netherlands. Not this exact thing, but the idea of decorating out in front of your house after birth to kind of let everyone know. So that way they don't need to come bother you about that information is <laughs> still being done. And that term does still have a lot of associations with maternity. So this specific thing did exist. Its origins are unknown. A lot of the early histories will mention that it might have appeared during the time of the Spanish Netherlands, but some sources will even say that it actually was the Spanish that said, put something on your door so we won't bother you as we invade, which seems terribly unlikely. And a lot of the historical references that mention this say it's not likely to actually be the case because the regions in which this is practiced don't line up with where the Spanish were or weren't. It seems to be kind of scattered around. So it's not likely that that's the origin of the practice, more likely that it was around that time that it was started. So that does go back further, but the color is a bit mixed and it definitely doesn't answer pink and blue for us. As for why we ended up with pink and blue, it's a little bit more difficult to say. The most common theories that I've seen have to do with potentially that, as we mentioned before, light blue is associated with the Virgin Mary, pink is associated with Jesus in a lot of earlier representations. This seems to potentially have been the case in France, where we know the practice existed prior to the Protestant Revolution. 
and that's when they switched over to the opposite way, at which point it became more of an emotional opinion of the genders and an emotional opinion of the colors. Not surprisingly, throughout history, we've had a lot of strong opinions about what colors mean. Green, for example, we usually associate with plants and new life, things like that. But things like blue and red or derivatives of red are really strongly emotionally opposed to each other. So we tend to think of blue as very calm and red as very energetic. And depending on how they viewed the genders during that time, they would choose accordingly. So they might see blue as a girl's color because they think of the feminine energy as being calmer, more serene, more innocent. They might think of red as much more aggressive and angry and therefore very masculine. Or they might think of it as the opposite way, that girls are super emotional and therefore it makes more sense for them to have red tones. And that boys need to be more calm and level headed and associated that way. So depending on the culture at the time and the way that they viewed those genders, they took these two very opposing colors that generally get termed as calm and emotional and applied them accordingly. So I personally feel like this makes the most sense in the fact that we just already happen to associate those colors on opposing sides and we did the same thing with genders in different time periods in different locations in different ways and that's how we ended up with that color. But even if this is the source of blue and pink as gendered colors, it doesn't answer how we started applying those specifically to infants to announce births, to dress them in that clothing, and eventually came to the point where pink became a severely gendered thing for adults as well. And that is where we have to go back to that Dutch practice because I found by the time we reached the mid 19th century, they we're not the only ones doing that. What makes this really important is the fact that the idea of a birth announcement using a color coding system does track very well with other references that I found throughout the 19th century well into the 1890s as the main way that we tended to use colors for representing gender. It's not about what the babies are wearing, it's about the announcement. So when someone had a baby, they would send out cards announcing this and they would use color-coded cards or add a little ribbon to the card, perhaps other decorations in order to announce the gender of the baby after it was born. And this seems to be the primary use of those colors regardless of what they are really until the 20th century. Simply because most infants and children throughout the 19th century, even before that, are dressed in white and they're dressed pretty agender. So we don't differentiate between boys and girls clothing until really around age four to six. The reason for this, boys clothing is going to resemble men's clothing. And when you think about 19th century closures, that's a lot of buttons. We don't want to deal with all of those buttons and diapers or bathroom emergencies. So until the little boys are able to take care of all the fasteners on their own and be fully potty trained, they're not going to put them into adult style clothing with the exception of like little costumes and fun things like that. But on a daily basis, you're usually going to see white gowns on children regardless of gender. The white is chosen because it's just plain practical for laundering. When cotton became more popular in the late 18th century, that's when little white dresses for children took off in popularity. They can be boiled, bleached, scoured. They can be blued up to look more bright white. We were already dealing with white as our primary undergarments. So shirts, shifts, all sorts of other basics, things that needed to be laundered for cleanliness purposes, most often were in white. So it only makes sense that we would continue to do so for infants and children who need their clothing washed on a regular basis. If nothing else, white shows dirt more easily, so you'll know when it needs to be washed. But on top of this, the dyes that were being used in the 19th century were still primarily natural dyes. This does start to change, but it doesn't actually fix the problem so much as create a new one. But these natural dyes were relatively temperamental when it came to heavy washing, especially boiling, and long-term exposure to things like the sun. So they would fade out with time. So something like a yellow would start to look pretty much like a dingy white before too long. Now, of course, we're trying to come up with new aniline dyes and other chemical types of dyes throughout the 19th century. Some natural colors can manage to hold up better. Cochineal, for example, is a very vivid red that comes from insects, and it tends to hold up to boiling in comparison to other reds and pinks. However, it's very expensive. So things that are considered wood pinks are much more likely to fade out and respond poorly to boiling. So things like safflower pink needed to be replaced in order to be viable options for heavily laundered clothing. They did start to discover options by the mid-century. Aloxin, for example, they discovered if they added tin and a gentle heat that that would produce pink as of 1851. But the problem is with a lot of these dyes, they're very experimental. 
And it's not just what color can we make, it's what color can we make and safely put up against human skin. We've all heard of the stories of arsenic, and the same goes for a lot of the other dyes that they were inventing during the 19th century. Science wasn't always putting safety first, and there are more than enough stories of people being poisoned or at least irritated by the dyes in their clothing, and infants are even more so susceptible to this. They're very sensitive when it comes to their skin, so a lot of the prescriptive literature of the time just says keep them in white, it's just a lot easier and safer, you don't have to worry about how the clothing was dyed. But as of the 1890s, we're really starting to move towards more modern synthetic dyes that are much safer, much more stable in their colors, and there are more and more options for children's clothing coming out. Even though color is becoming a more viable option for children's clothing, they're really not sure where the gender lines fall on this. What color means what is a big question. Some will say blue for boys and pink for girls, but some will say things like blue and pink are for girls, both of them. And then yellow or all white is preferred for boys. And there is actually a reversal of the colors, comparison to what we're used to today, it's just happening at the same time. This article from 1897 describes the first lady, Mrs. McKinley, who knitted baby socks for Grover Cleveland Jr. She made them in blue, quote, by mistake. As all the world which has experience in such things well knows, blue booties are for girls and pink are for boys. So clearly there was a misunderstanding there, whether that means Mrs. McKinley is of the blue for boys mindset and Mrs. Cleveland is of the pink for boys mindset or something else, I'm not sure, but there's definitely a little bit of confusion here. Add in the fact that not everyone wants to use gendered colors, many actually prefer to do it by complexion. So doing blue for a fair baby and pink for a brunette is increasingly popular around the turn of the century. But regardless of this conversation, white is still the standard for the vast majority of children's and infant wear. As of the beginning portion of the century, we're still looking at age four to six for most boys to move into more masculine, specifically styled clothing rather than children's clothing. And remember, when you're purchasing a layette for the baby, all of the things you're going to need immediately after birth, the diapers and the clothing for a newborn, they don't know what gender they're getting. So they're buying a layette whether it's all white or trimmed in blue or pink or another color without knowing the gender ahead of time. They are not choosing this based off of the birth of the child, they're choosing it based off of the color that they like. Knowing ahead of time what you're going to have isn't actually common until the 1990s, where it became more common and more accessible to people with not just a medical need, but in general. So knowing well in advance is a very recent change. So all of these things that are being purchased for newborns are not going to be gendered specifically because you just don't know. And you're going to end up needing to use them regardless. But this topic became a much more concerning conversation as dyes improved and more and more clothing for children was coming in colors and we were going for younger and younger gender styles. We started producing what we call fast colors as of the beginning portion of the 20th century. Companies like Sundor and Everfast came into being and they specifically made dyes that were not supposed to fade out much, if at all, within the wash or in the sun. Customers very quickly caught on to this and according to many articles by the 19 teens and 20s, they would not accept anything that wasn't color fast. So it was no longer an option to keep doing things out of the older styles of dyes that would fade out. Part of this concern apparently was around the fact that there was less and less household help, aka servants in the households, and people wouldn't do their own laundry. Instead, they would send it out to larger public laundries where things were going to get rather roughly washed. And if things weren't color fast, they were definitely not going to come back without fading. So there were apparently added concerns over the way that we were doing laundry as of the 1920s. But more and more children's clothing started being advertised in lots of bright and fun and fashionable colors by that point. As mentioned, it also started being more gendered. By 1923, Sears Catalog, which is a great example of the average clothing that we're really going to see in the US during this time, has boys clothing for as young as age two. And this is really interesting because you'll see a lot of children's clothing marketed rather gender free, even above that age. At some point you start to see some girl specific clothing sort of creep in, but a lot of times it's still referred to as children's clothing. 
Boys gets very specific much earlier by this point and is decidedly different in style. But there are increasingly less babyish clothing items for girls as well. Navy becomes a really popular color for girls' clothing. Just whatever seems to be trending at the time, they aren't specifically keeping it to pink and blue or children's colors as we're used to them today. As for the old adage in question, it is becoming increasingly concerning to people. They're writing into all of these newspapers and magazines to ask which way is it supposed to be? Tell me what way I should be doing this. I hear both and I'm not sure as a new parent what the answer is. So clearly there is a growing concern and confusion over this. It really culminates in a survey taken for the Modern Baby Book where they went and interviewed department stores around the US in 1929 and they found that it was completely mixed. It's not specific by region. As you can see, New York City has multiple examples back and forth. Chicago has multiple examples back and forth. I'm sure you could probably map this out in a certain way and really get down to exactly who's shopping at what type of store and maybe a pattern would start to appear there. But it seems pretty mixed at the point. And like, there's not really a wrong answer whether it's blue for boys, pink for girls, or pink for boys and blue for girls. So there is not a universal decision just yet. Of course, articles will always say, if you can't figure it out or you can't decide, just go with white. That's always the safe option. And other safe options became more popular as well. When Macy's opened their first baby center in a department store in 1936, they had both blue and pink for infants, but they also had yellow. And that was specifically for age one to three. Once they moved into age three to six, they had a much wider range of color options. They list hyacinth blue, japonica brown, primula pink, crocus moonlight, alpina green, and a begonia romance. So very uh, floral themed there, but tons of different colors for children, which clearly are not gender specific. However, due to the gendering of children's clothing and other social things that were starting to take place, this is where we start to see the shift. And part of this is due to the fact that children are moving away from infant-like clothing at an earlier age for both boys and girls. So this article from 1936 specifically states, try to put a boy in anything sissier than tan or navy today. Boys now dress like boys at an early age, but they also say girls go tailored just as soon which is to say that this is less about a gendered thing and dressing like a girl when they're younger and more a matter of no longer wanting to dress like a baby. They want to dress like an older child. And part of that includes colors that are not worn by infants, but are worn by children. So they're moving very quickly away from these baby things into children's clothing, which is not gendered in the same way. But this is really where we start to see the peak of gendering infants, starting in that late 1930s and moving through to the 1970s. By the 1970s, though, there's a lot of resistance to this. One article talks about in these liberated days, the notion of pink for girls nursery and blue for boys is becoming old hat. Psychologists are saying more color. So bright primary tones, regardless of gender, become a really trendy thing for babies because there's more and more concern about the way that children see color, the way that they interpret it, the happiness levels when they're surrounded by colors. And so they want big, bright primary colors, regardless of the child's gender. But this genderless swing does not last for long and we start heading back the other way. Somewhere along the way in this mid to late 20th century, we get to the idea that it's not just pink for girls and blue for boys, it's that pink is a girlish color and cannot be worn by boys or men. Blue well, is a little bit more negotiable. Even in the 1950s, where you would think the gendering is going to be at its peak, pink is still a really popular color for little boys' clothing. It's also a pretty popular color for men's clothing, as it was in the 19-teens as well. We go through different phases. So pink being worn by men or boys, even as of the 1950s, was apparently not that concerning. It's showing up in plenty of trendy magazines, so it clearly wasn't a big problem just yet. What seems to be happening, though, is that these lighter pastel colors are being associated with infants and that there is a growing interest in little girls continuing to be little girls for longer. Little boys need to grow up and be men. Much earlier, they need to be concerned about their specific adult gender, whereas girls need to remain as little children for longer in their pink frilly pretty dresses. And the infantilization of girls becomes a thing during that time period. And there's a lot to unpack with that that I'm not going to get to today, but that is an increasing concern of that era that girls are more associated with childhood and innocence. So that seems to be where the pull of these colors being associated with girls more so really comes from. 
add in the fact that we start to see a lot of color media as of the mid-century. Most things were being printed in black and white up until that point. So now suddenly we see a boom of color movies, of color advertisements, and all of these things are suddenly very bright and vivid. Think about the way that kitchens or bathrooms or houses presented in the mid-century, and we're going to think about color, bright and vibrant color. And this is also an era where the household in general is becoming more and more associated with women. It hit a peak in the 19th century with the idea of the different spheres for women and men, where women take care of the household, but we sort of transitioned away from that in the early 20th century, but we move back into it with the vengeance as of the post-World War II era, and the household full of these bright and vibrant and beautiful colors is becoming more and more associated with women. So when we see things like Mamie Eisenhower, who's decorating the White House, and she really loves pink. It's her favorite color, so she does pink and green, and that is being shown in magazines and articles in big, bold, bright colors. Other associations with famous women who became well-known for pink, like Marilyn Monroe, or even Barbie as of the 1970s, really start to gender pink, not just as a children's color, but as a woman's color. It's just specifically a feminine color. There are variations on this pink. It's not the same baby pink for everybody. In a lot of cases, it's much more vibrant and in your face, but pink becomes associated with this innocence and girlishness that is carried through into adult women in this era and becomes more and more associated with femininity. So we take that and we add in the concerns about sexuality that happened in the 20th century. Certainly homosexuality existed well before that, but they really weren't concerned about it on a household psychological level until we get into really more the mid 20th century. And there are more and more published articles talking about how it's really important to make sure that your child is trained from a very early age as to what's appropriate for their gender. This 1941 article tells a story of a young boy who basically just touched his mother's prink frilly lacy slip and because she didn't correct him, it set him down a path to liking all of the things that his mother enjoyed, all of the things that the girls enjoyed. And this became an increasing concern over his sexuality. When he was a little bit older, they sent him off to military school to set him back on the right track. So there was a direct correlation drawn pretty quickly between liking girlish things like pink and boys questioning their sexuality. Some psychologists would say that by the age of three, gender identity has been developed. And by dressing boys, not just in pink, but in other childish colors like yellow and green, you can start to confuse them, which just completely changes the mindset from really only half a century earlier when these same children would have been dressed as genderless babies up until age four or five in little white dresses with any random smattering of colors on them. Rather, now they're saying by age three, they need to be fully set in their gender. So there is a concern over making sure that the clothing is as gendered as possible, even if it's shaped in genderless ways like rompers, which is a really common thing for babies going all the way back to the 19 teens, they're now going to choose to make gender choices based off of color because the style is gender free, the colors have to make up for that. So hence we end up with this really strong, stringent idea of setting up, you have to have color differences for infants off the bat, it's really important for children to recognize their gender differences, and we start to associate specific colors one way or the other. That's more than just a little cute baby announcement, but instead really matters when it comes to the psychology of this child. <laughs> Interestingly enough, of course, today we've sort of pushed back on that idea that we have to gender children to that extreme degree, and that we really need to put those colors on them at a certain age, and that we can't dress them in more unisex ways because it's more practical. Instead, we've gone back to the blue and pink as a sort of announcement of the birth, even though it's happening before the birth with gender reveal parties. It's still very much like those early announcements that likely originated the use of those colors. So we've sort of gone full circle, even though we have a much more stringent set of what that color means today than they ever did historically. All of this to say, of course, that the idea that a color has a specific gender or is more masculine or more feminine is entirely made up and specific to our modern day society's culture. It doesn't stretch back terribly far because it's just mixed up and all over the place. And they're going to associate these colors different ways in different eras and different places. So the concept of pink is a girly color and blue is a boyish color. It's all basically just made up nonsense and go with whatever makes you happy.